Today, I'm going to be talking with you about assessing skin involvement in the Ehlers-Danlos syndromes and hypermobility spectrum disorders. Hi, my name is Dr. Claire Francomano, and I'm a medical geneticist who's been taking care of patients with Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, hypermobility spectrum disorders, and other hereditary disorders of connective tissue for many, many years. Skin is a very important organ for us to look at in making the diagnosis of the Ehlers-Danlos Syndromes. And for that reason, I think it's worthwhile to spend some time thinking about the various ways that it can present in people who have these diagnoses. So the first thing we look at is the texture of the skin. Many people with Ehlers-Danlos syndromes and with hypermobility spectrum disorders also may have extremely soft skin, or it may be described as kind of doughy in texture. Now, this is a subjective thing, and we don't have hard and fast measure of the softness of skin, but it can be really useful. I mean, a lot of times people will tell me that their parents or their children or their spouse has commented frequently on how soft their skin is. And when you feel it, it can be really unusually soft. So this is something that's worthwhile taking a look at. The next thing we want to assess is, is it unusually stretchy or hyperextensible? So in the hypermobile type of Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, this is usually mild hyperextensible, but in the classical type and classical-like type, it can be extremely stretchy. So what do we mean by those cutoffs? So for the classical type of Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, we look for extensibility of the skin of more than three centimeters on the distal forearm, the elbow, or at the knees and the neck. And we can also see a 1.5 centimeter hyperextensibility on the back of the hand. So looking here, how much stretch do you have on the skin of the hand? And we look at the distal forearm, the elbow, the knee, and the neck. And there are a number of ways to measure this that go from very low tech to extremely high tech. So the highest tech uh, possibility is there are these electronic calipers that you can get now that will actually measure the distance between the two ends of the caliper, and it just reads it right off. That's really high tech. There's another way you can use these old-fashioned calipers that we used to use for measuring EKG distances, and you can see how far you can extend the skin, and then on the same, the same caliper has a cap that has a ruler on it, and you can hold this on and, and measure against that to see how far the extension was. And finally, there is is the estimating approach, which many of us use every day in the clinic. And that is to know that the, the distal phalanx of the thumb is about an inch in most people. So that's 2.54 centimeters. So if you can pull the skin out, the whole distal phalanx of the thumb when you're pinching it out, that means the extensibility is at least two and a half centimeters. So a few ways to assess for that stretchy skin. Now, the other thing we look at is whether or not people have scars that are unusual. And the scars that we see in many people with EDS and some people with HSD are what we call atrophic scars. These are scars resulting either from a linear laceration or from surgery intervention, and they have widened out over time. So they no longer present as a nice thin line where the surgical scar was or the laceration was, but they have widened out. And they're not extending out from the skin, but underneath the surface of the skin. And so kind of a little bit of a crater, if you will. And the skin in the scar looks very thin and it's often wrinkly. In the old days, we used to call these cigarette paper scars because they resemble the 
appearance of the kind of paper that people would use when they would roll their own cigarettes, which was thin and wrinkly. And so it really resembled that paper. So the presence of atrophic scars, if people have more than two or more scars that are atrophic, that is one of the features in the diagnostic criteria for the hypermobile type of Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. We also ask about the presence of stretch marks, and we look for this on the physical exam. It's very important to ascertain whether or not people develop those stretch marks as a result of weight gain or weight loss or as a result of pregnancy. But often patients will tell us that those stretch marks appeared even before puberty and without any excessive weight gain or weight loss. So that's another thing to look for. We ask people if their skin is fragile, does it split really easily, and do they have easy bruising? That's another skin feature that is commonly found in many of the different types of Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. There's a feature called piezogenic papules that we look for on the skin of the heels. We have the person stand on their feet with their shoes off so we can look at the skin of their heels. And the piezogenic papules are these little bumps. They almost look like peas underneath the skin. And they represent a herniation of the subcutaneous fat kind of sticking out through the subcutaneous connective tissue that is just behind the skin on the heels. And those piezogenic papules are another one of the items on the diagnostic criteria for the hypermobile type of Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. There are a certain type of scars that we look for on the shins that are very typical of the classical type of Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. Those scars may have a lot of bruising underneath them. We call them hemosiderotic scars. And sometimes they have a kind of a fish mouth appearance that because they result from the skin splitting on those shins as a result of trauma. Often when children are just starting to learn to walk and they're kind of toddling around and bumping into furniture and the skin will split and create these fish mouth type scars and the hemosiderotic bruising that goes along with them in the classical type of Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. And there are two other skin features that I think it's worth mentioning that are commonly seen in the classical type of Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. One of these is called molluscoid pseudotumors, and these are very soft, movable nodules that are underneath the skin. Typically, they're maybe the size of a small lemon or even smaller, and they just feel squishy, and they may be on the knees or the elbows, and they often have very wrinkly skin on top of them. And there's also something called subcutaneous spherules, which are more like they are harder in texture, feel a little bit like gravel underneath the skin. And those can also be seen in the classical type of Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. So that's a kind of a brief overview of the many ways in which the skin can be involved in different types of Ehlers-Danlos syndrome and hypermobility spectrum disorders. If you're interested in learning more about how these fit into the diagnostic criteria for the Ehlers-Danlos syndromes and hypermobility spectrum disorders, I recommend you take a look at the YouTube video I've done on the diagnoses of these conditions. So thanks so much for being with me today, and I wish you the very best on your journey.